Guys, as the uh, teens come forward to do a uh, special presentation for you, uh, yesterday me and Brother Kevin had the opportunity to uh, fellowship with uh, Pastor Tim back here, and we uh, went over to Simpkins Town was working on some sound equipment. I'm going to tell you what, the experience of God was in that place and was in this place. There was two times that we can testify that the Spirit of God fell on us because we were in one accord with an agreeance that the presence of God was going to be there. We had a time of prayer for this service this morning. The presence of God was there. The anointing God was there. And so the song that these teens are getting ready to uh, do is called Breathe On Me. And as a way of introduction for it, I think about Breathe On Me. I think about three things in the Bible in reference to breathing. The first one was in the beginning when God created us from the dust of the earth. And he had to breathe life into us. He breathed his very life into us. And then the second time in the Bible I think about God breathing was in Ezekiel when he was in the valley of dry bones. And he asked him, he said, can these bones live again? And his response was a response of faith. He said, you know God. And God breathed into the valley and new life come upon that army. A great and mighty powerful army for the Lord. And then the third one I think about is when the disciples were in the upper room. And they were in one accord in agreement with each other, kind of like we are this morning. We're all in one accord. We're all here for the same purpose, for the same reason, to lift up God, to worship God, to grow in His knowledge and truth. And we're in one accord like it were in the upper room. And that day in the upper room, the presence of God, the Spirit, the wind of God blew into the upper room. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. And so I encourage you as they go to do this today, as they go to present this for you this morning, is have an expectation that the presence of God will blow in this place. Do we need Him in our lives? Yes. Do we need the Spirit of God active in our lives? Yes. Do we need Him to breathe on us daily and renew us daily? Yes. So Lord, please breathe on us.
Praise God that he sends the fire. As we get started this morning, uh, when you come in, I had the ushers direct you to uh, get a rock out of the basket back here. Uh, if you wasn't able to do that, uh, if you'll just signify uh, to the ushers, just uh, lift up your hand. It's going to be a great significance uh, or later on in the service. I'd really like you to have one uh, as we move forward. As everybody knows, today is 9-11, the 15-year anniversary of the attacks on our great nation. And throughout the week in, uh, in my criminal justice class, we've looked at this. We watched a video called the World Trade Center. And I think about the things that took place that day. And so, Savannah, if you'll go ahead and put that picture up for me. It's going, sorry. I seen the picture right there and it really stood out to me. When this took place, 107 police officers lost their lives either on that day or because of the events that day leading to cancer or something like that. 343 fire firefighters or paramedics died. And 2,996 of our Americans died that day, total. And so in just a minute, I want to have a time of prayer just to pray for the families that have lost so much on 9-11. But before we move further, if you served in the military, if you served law enforcement as a firefighter, a paramedic, if you would please just stand up real quick so we can honor you for the sacrifices you make. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you that we have the opportunity, Lord, that we can come into your house freely. We can come into your house without persecution, Lord, that we have the right to come into your house, into your presence, and worship you. Lord, I thank you for the people that made the sacrifices on 9-11. Lord, the ones that gave their lives to help others. Lord, I ask you to put a hedge of protection around our military, our fire, our police, our EMS. Lord, I ask you to be with the families that have lost loved ones due to this event. Lord, be with them, comfort them today. Lord, we know that tragic things happen, but we know through the midst of it that God, your glory would shine and that you would take care of us and protect us. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to have this service this morning. I thank you for your presence and the Spirit of God that's moving in this place. Lord, as we move forward in the service this morning, I ask you to anoint me. Lord, let it be me as a vessel and your Holy Spirit use me Speak through me this morning. Prepare our hearts and our souls to receive the word this morning. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Like I said, as you notice when we come in, I was, the ushers were asking you to pick up a, uh, a rock. And when you look at the rocks, if you look at the person beside you, they can have some similarities to it, but each one's kind of different in its own way. Our rocks might kind of look the same, but they might have a different meaning for each one of us. Um, we're going to do a couple things with them later as we move forward. Uh, one thing the rocks are not for is to throw at me on the way out the door if you don't like the message today. Dad, uh, he said, son, he said, you know, he said, know what you're doing? He said, you're giving a room full of people rocks to throw at you when you preach. And so uh, I promise you, if you it, that I hope you don't fall asleep, but if you do, I'll throw one at you. No, I'm just picking. 
So as a way of introduction today, I'm going to talk about the importance of having a rock, a solid foundation. And I'm going to use a children's story to illustrate this. The story I'm going to use is the story of the three little pigs. Most of us know the story. We've heard it before. Once upon a time, there was three little pigs. And one pig built his house of straw. And the other built his house of sticks. They built their houses very quickly, and then they went out and sang and played and had a good time all day. But it was the third little pig that worked hard all day long. And he made his house of bricks. And when the big bad wolf saw the two little pigs while they were dancing and playing, he thought, what a juicy, tender meal they will make. He chased the two pigs, and they went into their houses. And when the big bad wolf went to the first house, he huffed and he puffed, and he blew the house down. The frightened pig went to the second house that was made of sticks. And the big bad wolf now came to this house, and he huffed and he puffed, and he blew the house down. Now the two little pigs were terrified and ran to the third pig's house. But yet it was made of bricks. And the big bad wolf tried to huff and puff and blow down the house but he could not. He kept trying for hours. But the house was very strong and the little pigs were safe. Well, you know the rest of the story, how it ended up for the wolf. Now, there's a TV show that Grace watches all the time called Super Why. It's supposed to help uh, be educational, help them be able to read and things like that. So one of the superpowers that, the, uh, that Why has on there is he has the ability to change the story. And so we're going to do that for a moment. We're going to change this story just for a moment. And we're going to start out as, once upon a time there was three Christians. The first Christian built his house on conformity and understanding. Not on the doctrine of God, but on feel good. On what everybody else, what society expected him to build his house on. The second Christian built his house on drive through religion, feel-good religion. They went to church, but they wanted to leave happy. They didn't want to hear the whole doctrine of God. They didn't want to hear the full doctrine of God. They were using the wrong blueprints to build their house. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Our body is the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And they were building small temples. They were building weak temples. They didn't spend time working on it. They didn't spend time in church. They didn't spend time studying the Word of God. They didn't spend time praying. They just threw it together real quick. So they could go out and do what they wanted to do. So they could sing, play, and dance, and live it up in the world. They built a temporary shelter that was supposed to be for a permanent resident. Let me say it again. They built a temporary shelter that was made for a permanent resident. On the outside, the houses looked good. But on the inside, they were at the brink of collapsing. Now, the third Christian, they worked hard all day. And he built his house with bricks. He studied the Word of God. He spent time in prayer. He made time for God, alone time with God. He seeked the face of God. And he built it on a strong foundation. He built his house on the rock. And then the wolf came. And Matthew 7 and 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The wolf came. 1 Peter 5 and 8, he describes the enemy that says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. You see, the enemy came and chased the first two Christians. He came against them. And when he began to tempt them, he began to put things in the first Christian's life 
his temple, his house collapsed because it wasn't on a strong foundation. With the second Christian, when the wolf came and began to put pressure in his life, began to come against him in his life, his house collapsed. But the third Christian, who built his house on a firm foundation, on the rock of God, a solid foundation, when the wolf came, he was able to stand strong against the attacks of the devil. It wasn't tempted. It didn't fall into the temptations. It was able to stand because of the foundation of God. Matthew 7 to 24, Everyone then who hears the, these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and being on the house, but it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Church, it is very important that we build our house on a strong foundation, on the foundation of God, on the, the true doctrine of the Word of God. We can't take the things out of the Word of God that we don't like. There's things in there that hurt. There's things in there that convict. Conviction ain't supposed to be fun. Conviction leads to you confessing. We got to have a strong foundation. There's an old song, and I got some of the words here. And I just, as I was listening to it, they just stand out how powerful the words are. It's a question that says, where do I go when there's nobody else to turn to? Who do I talk to when nobody wants to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain. And the mountain, he stands by me. When the earth all around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, I go to the rock. Where do I go? When the storms of life are threatening. Where do I turn to those winds and sor when the winds of sorrow blow? And is there a refuge in a time of tribulation? Go to the rock. I know he's able. And when the earth around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. I can stand when I need a friend. I go to the rock. This morning, for each of you that's holding a rock, it could be a representation of something different for each one of us. It could be an illustration of something different for each one of us, something that we're going through in our life. If you would go to Bible Gateway and type in the word rock, it will give you 135 scriptures where the term rock is used. And so we're going to go over a couple of stories in the Bible and I want you to take a self-reflection if this applies to your life. And we're going to see what the, that rock means to you. In 1 Samuel, a rock was used to kill a giant. 1 Samuel 17, 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. 1 Samuel 17, 48 goes on to tell us when the Philistine arose and came to draw near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put in his hand, excuse me, David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his head. The stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on the face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine, and killed him. 
Maybe you are fighting a giant in your life. Maybe you have come against something in your life. Something has come against you in your life that you are not able to take on yourself. You don't know how you're going to prevail over it. You don't know how you're going to get through the situation. You don't know how you're going to hold your marriage together. You don't know how you're going to get money in the bank account. You don't know how you're going to get your kids back home. It don't matter what the giant is. I know that we have a God that is a rock that will help you prevail over the giants in your life. Maybe you are facing multiple giants in your life. Every time you turn around, there's something else coming at you. Maybe hell has done an all-out offensive attack on your life and your family. You said David picked up more than one stone that day. He said he picked up five stones. Not because he doubted God and wanted a couple extra just in case. He picked up five stones because he knew he had more giants to kill in the future. In 2 Samuel 21, King David's men killed four more giants. And they were all descendants of the original. That day he prepared himself for the battle. He prepared himself for what he was going to go through in the future. Church, I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you're going through. And I don't know what you're facing in life. I don't know what kind of giants are coming up against you. But I know that God took a shepherd boy and put a rock in his hand. And he took down a giant. And you can do the same if you have faith in God. Maybe that rock today represents the victories that you're going to have over the giants in your life. In Psalms, the rock is our shelter. Psalms 18.2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. No matter where you, what you go through in life, no matter how bad the storm gets, we can find refuge in the house of the Lord. Psalms 48, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. The storms of life are hard. But we can find refuge in the presence of God. We can find refuge with Him. He is our rock. If we stand on him, we can have refuge. He will shelter us. He will protect us. Maybe that rock is a representation of the shelter that God will provide for you through the things you're going through. In Exodus 17, God calls water to come from a rock. It says in Exodus 17, 5, And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. God can make water come from a rock. He can provide the needs in your life. Maybe the rock is a reminder that God is Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, our provider. He's Jehovah Jireh over your checkbook. He's Jehovah Jireh over your transportation. He's Jehovah Jireh over your job. He's Jehovah Jireh over your house. And he's even Jehovah Jireh over your refrigerator. You may ask, Pastor, how's God going to provide it? I don't know. I can't tell you how he's going to do it. But I can tell you he's going to do it. That tank of gas is going to go a little bit further. That loaf of bread is going to make a couple extra sandwiches. God is going to provide. Maybe that rock is a representation in your life that no matter what the struggles you are going through right now, God is going to provide for you. you got to keep the faith. But God will provide. In John 8, the rock of salvation stopped the adulterous woman from being stoned. 
Verse 3 says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him. They might have some ch charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him with, who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Maybe the rock this morning is a representation of a hurt, of a wrongdoing that's been done against you. A family member that's hurt you. A friend that's hurt you. A loved one that's hurt you. Maybe you're holding on to that rock and anger. And bitterness. Because you can't let go of what they did to you. Maybe instead of this being a representation that maybe it's time we lay that rock down. Maybe it's time we get healing from that. Matthew 6 and 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. I know we all get hurt. I know it's hard not to hold a grudge. I know when somebody wrongs you, it's still deep down inside of you. But God tells us we got to forgive them. We got to lay that stone down because we're not without fault. We're holding that stone over somebody's head when there's probably people willing to hold a stone over ours. God says we got to lay that stone down. Matthew 18, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter thought that was a good amount, seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, God didn't mean that 490 times you forgive him and 491 you throw the rock. God was meaning that it was not to be counted. Thank God he forgives us, yet we struggle to forgive others. Thank God that God forgives us quicker than we forgive others. That God loves us enough that he forgives us. How many times do I hurt him in a day? How many times do I break his heart? Yet every single time he is faithful to forgive me. Maybe it's time that we put that stone down. In Luke, Jesus said that the stones would cry out. Luke 19, 39, And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, then the stones would immediately cry out. Maybe that rock is a reminder to you that you don't want to have a rock crying out for you. That you don't want to have a, a rock worshiping in your place. Matthew 27 and 52, And the graves were open. When Jesus died on the cross, said, The graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. The rocks cried out that day when Christ died. He foretold of what was going to happen. He said, if nobody's worshiping me, if they are not worshiping me, that the rocks are going to cry out. And on that day when he died on the cross, when the world had turned their back on him, the rocks cried out. I ain't going to judge nobody on this, but you think you had a walking dead problem now. You had a walking dead problem then. Said the dead rose and walk in the streets. There's proof there's zombies out there. <laughs> I 
You see, the rock could not hold him. And Matthew, the stone could not hold him. The stone was rolled away, and there laid an empty grave. Matthew 28, 5, But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. Maybe it's a representation, the rock is a representation today that the grave could not hold him. Maybe that rock is a representation of the salvation of Jesus Christ. The death, the resurrection of Christ. He come out of the grave. The stone was rolled away. Maybe you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior. Maybe you've never accepted him. But I tell you this. Jesus loves you. And he died on the cross for you. For your sins. For your transgressions. For your mistakes. And they buried him in a borrowed tomb. They sealed it with the stone. But I tell you this, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And that stone could not hold him in. And he sits on the right hand of the Father, victorious. And all we have to do is accept him as our personal Savior. Matthew 11 and 28 says, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, the thing about rocks is when we, we all have different meanings for it. It all speaks to us different, applies to our life different. But the problem is, is when we're carrying the wrong rocks and life around with us. See, when we're carrying the rock of sin around, it burdens us down. We struggle. Maybe it's anger that you're carrying around. Maybe you're depressed. Depression's heavy. Maybe it's the guilt of your past that you're carrying with you. Maybe it's hurt. That friend, that loved one that done you wrong. Maybe it's addiction that you're carrying around. The thing about it is, when you're carrying all these things around, the weight of the world gets awful heavy. You might be able to carry it around for a while, but eventually it's going to start to take a toll on you. You can put up a front for a while, you can fool your family and your friends for a while. On the outside, you might look good. Your house might look good on the outside, but on the inside, it's on the brink of collapse. But I tell you something about the way of the world. It'll push you down. It'll bring you down. It'll weight you down. It will bring you to your knees. 
But the good thing about being on your knees is you can always look up to Christ our Savior. Your knees is a good place to be when you're praying. The way that the, way of the world might drive you down, might press you down, but Jesus Christ will lift you up. He said, cast your burdens upon me and I will give you rest. As we're coming to a close this morning, what does that rock represent in your life? Maybe it's a reminder of his power over the giants in your life. Maybe it's a reminder of his shelter that he'll protect you. Maybe it's a reminder that God will provide. Maybe it's a reminder to engage in worship and not to let a rock cry out for you. How many know there's power in worship? People get delivered in worship. The captive gets set free in worship. People get healed in worship. It ain't just going through emotion. It ain't just setting the stage for the service. It's literally entering the throne room of God. And when we begin to worship God and lift up God, the presence of God fall and strongholds are loosed in the name of Jesus. Maybe it's rock is a reminder of a hurt. Or maybe it's a reminder that the grave could not hold him. If I have one of the ushers bring the pail of rocks up front for me, please. If we're coming to a close, I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you don't have that relationship with Him. Or maybe you have and the weight of the world has caused you to have separation between you and God. Then I want to give you the opportunity today not to embarrass you, but that you would be able to come in a covenant relationship with Christ, our Savior. With no one looking around, eyes closed, head bowed. If you want to accept Christ as your personal Savior this morning or you want to rededicate you, your life, I ask you just to raise your hand. God sees your hand. Anybody else this morning? God sees your hand. You put your hands down. Is there anybody else this morning? Wait a moment longer. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. Praise God. I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else? Church, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for saving me. I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm saved by grace. Forgive me for my sins. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and let me have eternal life with you. Thank you for saving me. I asked Brother Randy to uh, lead us in a song this morning. And I'm getting ready to open the altar up. For the ones that prayed that prayer, maybe it was the first time you prayed it. Maybe you were rededicating your life. But this morning, I ask you to go tell somebody as a step of faith that you prayed that prayer this morning. Myself, Pastor Perry, Pastor Sheila, Pastor Tim, one of us. And let us know you prayed that prayer. Now, the second thing we're going to do this morning is I'm going to ask the prayer team to work their way forward. There's two things that God laid on my heart this morning. And that is this. 
If, your whole, if that rock is a representation in your life of a hurt or hang up, a wrongdoing, an addiction, then I'm going to ask you to come forward this morning and loose it and throw it into the pail to get rid of it in life. Taking a stand that you're going to say, I'm not going to let that affect me anymore. Maybe this rock was a representation of the burdens you're carrying in life. Maybe you're carrying burdens that ain't your responsibility to carry. Maybe you're struggling with something in life. This morning, Randy starts singing that song. I ask you to come join us in the altar. And if you need to get rid of something in your life, let's lay it at the altar this morning.